we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you um, to the second part of our six park uh, part parked at home discussion series. Uh, today, we'll be talking about construction, uh, specifically the construction and engineering feats of transportation canals of the early 19th century. My name is Mark Mello. I'm a park ranger at Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. I'm joined by my colleague, Allison Horrocks, this evening. Uh, if you were with us last week, Allison and I have just flipped roles and responsibilities. Uh, I will be uh, actively participating in the discussion, and Allison is going to be doing a lot of those behind the scenes, uh, a lot of the behind the scenes work. Um, so if you do have any technical difficulties throughout the course of the presentation, feel free to reach out to Allison directly about those. And of course, we always want to encourage you uh, to put your questions and your comments in the chat. Uh, we'll be sure to incorporate some of those throughout the, uh, the discussion this evening. This program is being recorded, uh, so feel free to have your camera on or off. It's up to you, whatever your preference is, and however you feel comfortable. And we please ask you to remain on mute for the duration of the formal part of our presentation this evening. I would also like to thank the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor uh, and the representatives thereof for co-hosting this series with us. Uh, we couldn't do it without them using the Zoom platform here, so we're grateful uh, for them co-hosting the series with us. I'm also joined this evening uh, by Ranger Rebecca Jones of Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Rebecca is an interpretive park ranger at Cuyahoga, and we're extremely grateful and happy uh, to have her jo join us this evening for our discussion. Today's discussion will take a closer look at the construction and operation of transportation canals in the early years of the United States. We'll discuss the close parallels and shared experiences of many who built, profited from, or still enjoy these human-made waterways today. We'll also be discussing some of the ways in which the Ohio and Erie Canal and the Blackstone Canal differed, and what are the lessons we can learn about these intriguing places. And so I'm going to get us started this evening with a brief overview of the specific park node within Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park that we're going to focus on. And then I'll ask Rebecca to do the same, kind of giving us an introduction to Cuyahoga uh, and all the really cool resources and things that they do there. So for those of you who are not familiar with Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park, uh, the park is comprised of six park nodes, and that's NPS lingo basically for six separate sites that are non-contiguous, they don't physically connect boundaries. But each one of those six sites tells a different part of the story as the Blackstone River Valley being kind of this incubator in this heart of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so each one kind of shares a different facet of the story. I always use the analogy, if you think of the Blackstone River Valley as an ocean, right? Think of our park sites as islands in that ocean. These individual locations that are, don't share a boundary, but each one is important in helping to further tell that story of industrialization in the valley. On your screen now, I have a map of the valley, and so you can see on the map that uh, it extends from Worcester, Massachusetts, all the way down to Providence, Rhode Island. And that blue line, that main trunk of the Blackstone River, runs from Worcester all the way down to Providence. And each one of those emblems, every time that you see the National Park Service arrowhead on the map, that indicates one of those six specific sites that makes up the park. And so tonight, we're going to focus in on the Blackstone River State Park, one of those six sites that make up the National Historical Park. And the Blackstone River State Park has a lot of cool features, a lot of interesting ways that you can enjoy uh, this, uh, the beautiful, the beauty, uh, the history, the culture, the natural uh, wonder of the Blackstone Valley. And so on this slide, entitled Blackstone River State Park, Lincoln, Rhode Island, uh, you can see some of those different ways that you could engage with this specific part of Blackstone River Valley National Historical Park. 
One of my favorite ways to engage uh, with the site is the Blackstone Bikeway. Uh, and we have about a mile segment of the Blackstone Bikeway that runs through the heart of the park, kind of serving as this artery for cyclists, dog walkers, runners, just casual walkers to engage and recreate at the site. And so the image at the center of your screen uh, kind of shows people doing just that, right? People standing by their bikes, reading the kiosks and the different wayside panels at the park. Uh, you can see the bikeway bridge, which crosses the river at that point. Um, and so a really interesting way to engage with the site. Uh, the image on the right also shows someone doing just that, right? A, a lady in a red shirt riding on a bike down a dirt path uh, that goes by the Captain Wilbur Kelly House Transportation Museum. And the Captain Kelly House Transportation Museum is another great resource, another great asset that the site has to offer. Uh, it is uh, pictured there in the bottom left portion of your screen, a two-story uh, 1835 structure uh, that helps to, is now used as a museum to help tell the story of the transportation revolution and how that really connects to the, the more broad story of industrialization in the Blackstone Valley as well. You can also take in the uh, beautiful vistas and natural landscapes, the natural sights and sounds of the valley at the site. Uh, one of my favorite places to stand is pictured on the top uh, center portion of your screen there on the bikeway bridge, looking south down the Blackstone River. Uh, and it's really kind of this interesting juxtaposition, right, of the natural beauty of the valley and the industrial heritage of the valley. Pictured on the left-hand side of the river, what is the east side of the river, is the four-story tall brick Ashton Mill. And so today, now, both the combining of this industrial landscape and the natural landscape. There are also other historic structures and remnants, foundations of historic structures, uh, located all across the site. The foundation of the Kelly Mill, a tenement house, a gasometer, so there's a lot of really interesting ways to engage with the site. But I think one of the most intriguing and is going to be the heart of our conversation today is a segment of the original Blackstone Canal. And this segment extends even south of the park and makes up what is nearly a three mile segment of the original Blackstone Canal. And it serves as one of the best preserved and longest contiguous remnants of the canal that we see anywhere in the valley. Of course, the other notable exception to that is at Riverbend Farm up in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, there is another beautifully preserved segment of the canal there as well. But we'll really kind of focus our attention today on the Blackstone River State Parks uh, segment of, of that. And so let's kind of zoom out and take a very 50,000 foot view, if you will, a very broad view of the history of the Blackstone Canal and how it comes to be that this canal that you see pictured in the top left hand portion of your screen of uh, this human made waterway is constructed and why is it constructed. Uh, and our story really begins, of course, with the industrialization of the valley. Industrialization, as I always say to people, is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not as if when Sam Slater invents those first water-powered cotton spinning machines in North America in Pawtucket that uh, the Industrial Revolution started out of nowhere, right? It's a process. It was something that was built up to uh, and continued for decades after that pivotal moment in 1790. Um, and eventually by the 18 teens, 1820s, we start to see the spread of industrialization and industrial textile mills, especially across the valley, up the valley, uh, moving up to Worcester, Massachusetts. And it's really this spread of industrialization and the need to find a cheaper and easier way to transport goods, not necessarily faster, but a cheaper and easier way to transport goods and more goods that we see both the legislatures in Massachusetts and Rhode Island agree to charter a canal company by the early 1820s. And that will begin in 1825, uh, the process of actually building, digging this canal. This canal, this human-made waterway that is going to transport goods across the landscape. It is primarily, it was primarily dug by Irish immigrants. Um, 
St. Patrick's Day, a lovely connection. I wish that we could say that we planned it. We didn't, but it's a happy happenstance that uh, we talk about this on St. Patrick's Day, right? The idea that many of these uh, laborers who dig this canal are Irish immigrants. And these people are skilled laborers. I think that that's an important point. A lot of people think of uh, perhaps the labor of hand digging a canal with pickaxes and shovels and wheelbarrows um, as menial labor. It's not. This is skilled labor. These were skilled craftspeople who helped to build, um, to dig this canal. Uh, the segment of the canal that runs through the state park today uh, it was originally dug in 1827, so near the end of construction. Construction of the canal lasts between 1825, and by 1828, it is open uh, and in operation. So this segment of the canal that we see pictured here on the screen, photo taken um, from the perspective of pedestrian bridge that goes across the canal, looking south down the canal, um, is one of the segments that we see running through uh, the state park there. This trench was dug by hand, pickaxes, shovels, wheelbarrows. Um, there are a few exceptions where black powder was actually used. We actually see one of those sites in the state park itself at Canoe Rock, um, where they actually had to use black powder to blast through rock. But that was the exception to the rule. Most of this, uh, most of the canal is hand dug. Um, and it's pretty amazing when you consider that this canal being on average about 32 feet across the top at the top water line, about 18 feet at the bottom, with four to six feet of depth of water was all dug by hand. You can imagine the work that went into that. And in off, in, as is the case in this image, and happened quite frequently across the canal, uh, there were also these rock walls that we see here in the image on both sides up the canal um, that were masterfully crafted by those individuals who were building uh, this canal, right? There was no uh, fixatives, no mortar substances being used. Those are hand stacked uh, stones. And those stones that were placed nearly 200 years ago are still standing the test of time, right? That's a true testament to the work um, that uh, these folks did nearly 200 years ago. Uh, here on the slide on the right hand, we will see uh, what is a diagram of uh, the construction of the canal, a cross section of what the canal looked like. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's a little bit wider on top and kind of coming down in a prism shape um, on the bottom, on average 32 feet across the top, 18 feet across the bottom, with about a one half slope um, going down um, from the top of the canal to the bottom of the canal. The towpath was a pivotal part of the construction of the canal. And we can see that on the left side of the diagram. Uh, basically, one of the sides, one of the berms on the side of the canal was flattened out on the top. And on average, it was about 10 feet wide. Uh, and that is where the horses, the two horse team that would pull the canal barges are going to walk. These uh, barges are being powered by horses, two horses pulling the canal barge, walking along that towpath connected. The horses are connected to the barge using a rope. Another important part of the construction um, was the locks in the canal. Um, we always talk about how the Blackstone it, it wins this nickname by the late uh, 19th century of the hardest working river in the United States. One of the reasons why it was this kind of heart of industrialization and could power the river itself could power so many mills was because of its pretty substantial drop over a relatively short distance. Blackstone River is only about 46 miles long. And over those 46 miles, it drops 438 feet. That means that for every mile it travels, it drops about nine and a half feet. Compare that to the Colorado River. The Colorado River, which is much larger, has a lot more volume traveling down it, of course, but the Colorado drops only about eight and a half feet for every mile it travels. So there is a pretty dramatic drop over a short distance in the Blackstone River. That causes a problem, though, if you want to transport goods on that river. That means that the Blackstone had a lot of what? Waterfalls, rapids, um, and other sources of impediment that would not allow uh, 
water vessels, boats to, or barges to navigate most of the river or portions of the river. And so that was the necessity of the canal, right? You wanted to be able to kind of parallel the river, but have a waterway that was actually navigable. Um, but the problem is that you have to overcome that 438 foot difference um, between Worcester and Providence. So how do you do that? Well, you do that through locks. Um, and those locks, uh, about 48, 48 lift locks over the course of that uh, distance of about 46 miles that the canal will run between Worcester and Providence are going to be a sort of elevator system that are going to raise canal barges going towards Worcester and are going to lower canal barges to compensate for that difference. And again, right, when we talk about the labor that went into this, when we look at these three images here on your screen of locks, um, this particular one is the Millville Lock located in Millville, Massachusetts from three different perspectives. We see these really masterfully crafted hand cut pieces of granite, right? If you can imagine trying to hand cut this without the help of modern tools, um, it's pretty extraordinary that they were able to achieve what they could. And frankly, there are only two locks that are really well preserved along the length of the canal. And that has nothing to do with the skill and the talent of those who built the locks. The people who built these locks, many of them, these Irish immigrants who built these locks, um, built them so well that when the Blackstone Canal closed, if it was close to an urban population or a city or a town, people went out and tore the locks apart because these cut stone make perfect foundational stones for people's houses. Um, and really, we only have two real good remaining remnants of locks, one in Millville and one up at the Goat Hill Lock, which is in Riverbend Farm up in Uxbridge, because they were just far enough away from people's uh, from people that nobody really wanted to go through the trouble of dragging those stones um, to where they were living to help build uh, foundations for houses. So it's pretty uh, remarkable when you consider all of the backbreaking work and labor that went into um, the construction of these locks um, and the canal itself. Canal barges were on average anywhere between 40 to 70 feet long. Most of them are around that 70 foot long mark. Uh, think of a tractor trailer as kind of a comparable size and length. Um, and were manned by a three man crew uh, that could trans, and these barges could transport on average around 30 tons. Compare that to a wagon of the time. Most wagons of the time could only carry about one ton. So when we talk about the, uh, the benefits of the canal, right? Not only could you transport more goods in a single instant, but you also were transporting them at a cheaper rate. And so those are really the two true advantages to the canal, cheaper transportation um, and being able to transport more tonnage at any given time at one single instant across the landscape. To give you an idea of the flow of commerce across the landscape, in 1830, 9,312 trips were made up canal from points south to points north. 5,530 trips were made down the canal from points north to points south. And over the course of those trips, a total tonnage of 14,842 tons of goods were transported across the landscape. The transported tonnage included foodstuffs, lime, cotton, lumber, processed textiles, and other uh, goods. And so this uh, clip from the Massachusetts spy on the left side of your screen uh, which was a newspaper at the time, reporting on uh, the activity in the canal in April of 1830 and May of 1830, give us a pretty good in indication of what kind of materials were moving up and down the canal and also how much materials were moving up and down the canal. So in the, le in the left column, you can see for the month of April, um, to Worcester, 302 tons were transported, whereas leaving Worcester, about 114 tons were transported. Uh, if you go down to the third uh, name up from the bottom of that list, Kelly's Mill, Kelly's Mill was located within the section of the park that we're talking about now. And so about eight and a quarter tons went to Kelly's Mill during that time, went to this portion of the valley that we're talking about tonight, and about one ton left from there. And what did this include? Well, it included foodstuffs like corn, rye, flour, salt, molasses, spirits, 
oil and other things. It also included lime. Lime, especially in the area of the park that we're talking about now, the Blackstone River State Park, is very close to an area known as Lime Rock in Lincoln, Rhode Island. Lime Rock was one of the oldest quarrying operations in North America dating back to the 1650s. Um, and so transporting lime, which was being used in mortars of the time, um, was a key part of what was going up and down the canal, as well as, as you can see, uh, 889 bales of cotton, 125 bales of wool, um, and other finished products on uh, the right side of that left column there. And so there was a lot that was being transported up and down the canal. Uh, and I think that that's an important point. When we talk about industrialization, people usually associate industrialization with textiles, uh, but it's more than textiles. And what was traveling up and down the canal was more than textiles. And so I think that's an important point. By 1847, though, uh, the Providence and Worcester Railroad opened. And by the next year, 1848, the canal company closed its operations for good. Uh, and so the canal was effectively dead after only 20 years of operation. And I love this image on the screen right now. Uh, it shows the Blackstone Canal on the right side of the image, kind of overgrown uh, on its way. It has not been used now at this point, uh, at the point of this picture by the of the late 19th century for decades, kind of overgrown, kind of starting to fall into disrepair. And on the left side of the image, where the old towpath would have been, you don't see horses walking along the towpath but you see an iron horse, if you will, uh, a locomotive making its way down the towpath, the railroad causing the extinction of the Blackstone Canal. And so that was a very brief kind of overview of how the canal was built, who built the canal, and kind of its operations uh, and what happened. But while the Blackstone Canal was being dug, another canal was also in the process of being built, the Ohio and Erie Canal. Parts of the Ohio and Erie Canal are in one of 63, are in one of our 63 national parks, which is also part of one of our 423 National Park Service units located all across the country. And that is Cuyahoga Valley National, national Park. And so Rebecca, uh, I'm just wondering if you could kind of give us a little introduction to your park and then talk a little bit more about the Ohio, how the Ohio and Erie Canal specifically fit into that story um, of your national park. All right. Well, thank you. I learned a lot there, and um, I am in awe of your Irish immigrants digging, digging and shaping those stones through granite because our stones were limestone. So I'm going to try to share my screen here. I'm going to fly high initially. I'm going to fly very high. I'm going to actually take a 50,000 thing over the whole national park. Um, I am at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in northeastern Ohio. And like the Blackstone, we are a valley. We have a towel shaft, if you will, a valleyness. So here at Cuyahoga Valley National Park, we actually, we're a, a larger park. And unlike the Blackstone, we are a continuous park. We stretch from Lake Erie, from the southern limits of Cleveland, all the way down to Akron, which is 19 and a half miles. So we are 19 and a half continuous miles. We encompass 33,000 acres. That's 52 square miles for those of you that care. So we are continuous, unlike uh, Blackstone. Things that we talk about at Cuyahoga Valley is much like the Blackstone, we were a crucial transportation link. Like the Blackstone Valley, we've been lived in. He didn't talk about the American Indian peoples that may have lived there, but we've had people live here for over 12,000 years. And we consider ourselves a park for all people because we came into being in the 1970s when there was this big push to bring national parks to people. So we try to be a park for all people. Because we stretch from the city limits of Cleveland to the city limits of Akron, in those 52 square miles, we are a refuge for, nat for natural diversity. Of course, Cuyahoga Valley National Park is named after the Cuyahoga River. For those of you that are old enough to remember, we have the misfortune 
of being the poster child for environmental degradation and pollution with an unfortunate incident that happened in 1969. So we became an icon of the environmental movement. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the bigger picture of the National Park and then come in on the Ohio and Erie Canal. That Cuyahoga River, I've often said, is a little river with a great big story. We started out polluted, but in the 50 years since that river had the misfortune of burning for the last time, we've made a, com a comeback. So it's not just the Cuyahoga River, it's the comeback Cuyahoga. When we were created in 1974, we were created as a national recreation area. And it says in our enabling legislation that we are to protect the river and its pastoral values and its river environments. It doesn't specifically initially mention the Ohio and Erie Canal, but that comes in later documents as we start to dig into the history of that and realize the importance of that particular structure. As I said a moment ago, people have been living here for over 12,000 years, and it was the American Indians that were the first ones to use the Cuyahoga River, using it as a transportation system, as a trade route, if you will. Uh, 2,000 years ago, Ohio was the heart of a vast trading network, and even then they were using that Cuyahoga River. We know they were using the Cuyahoga River 300 years ago when they were trading for the beaver pelts and back and forth with that. So it was a known trading route, a known established route for people to travel on. And yes, much like the Blackstone, we also have a train in, in the national park that runs through the park. Trains did make a significant, sorry for the pun, inroad into the traffic on the Ohio and Erie Canal. But the canal had hung on, even though you started having trains on the edges of the valley, on the east and the west side of the valley, by the 1850s, the biggest year for our canal was during the Civil War. But the train actually came into the valley itself in 1880. Today, you can still ride on the descendant of that original Cuyahoga Valley line. And when you ride on that train, you're riding through a landscape that is relatively unchanged. Of course, just like Mark mentioned on the Blackstone, what the train replaced was that Ohio and Erie Canal. Within the National Park, we actually have about 19 and a half or so. It's measured in nautical miles, which is a little different than, as you know, land miles. But we have about 19 miles of canal prism. The northern section, which is about four miles, is still watered to this day. And actually, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's a building here in the upper right-hand corner. That is the Canal Exploration Center. It sits in front of the lock that is in the lower right-hand corner, which is, we hope, still a functioning canal lock. It has all the parts. And the reason I say we hope is we've had a few years without water, so we will have to do some repairs, but it is able to still work. So we still have a fully intact lock. We're gonna come back to the Ohio and Erie Canal, but this is one of those crucial transportation routes within the valley as well. We call ourselves a lived-in landscape because much like the Blackstone, we have various buildings that have survived. We have a couple of little villages within our boundaries. One is called Boston. And we have preserved buildings there. And then we also have a gateway community known as Peninsula. Now, Peninsula actually back in the 1960s realized it was losing its history. They banded together and they actually worked to make themselves a registered district on the National Register of Historic Dix Districts. Because as you come into the, come down the hill into the main part of town, or if you get off the train in the main part of town, you're going to think somehow you've been magically transported to New England because it is part of the Western Reserve, which was from Connecticut. But many of the original structures in the town are still there. 
Many of them are canal related. And by the way, the middle image here is not the canal, that's the Cuyahoga River. Running down the backbone of this entire national park for over 19 miles is also a towpath trail. It runs adjacent to the Ohio and Erie Canal prism. In places though, as Ben Franklin said, rivers are unruly things and sometimes the river would just kind of take out part of the canal. So in some places we are not continuous. The towpath trail is continuous, but it's been rerouted into a place where the trail originally wasn't. But you can ride 19 and a half miles along that former canal. Or you can walk or run or hike or bike or bird watch or beaver watch or do any other number of things. But don't stop there. I said earlier that we were between Cleveland and Akron. We have the, at our Northern end, we're at the Southern limits of Cleveland. And at our Southern end, we're at the Northern limits of Akron. At one time, our canal ran 308 miles. It's the Ohio and Erie, because it ran from Lake Erie to the Ohio River. Today, we are embedded in a larger Ohio and Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. So we have a national park within this larger corridor. So you potentially could get on your bicycle or strap on your boots up at Lake Erie and follow that Ohio to Erie Canal National Heritage Corridor 110 miles south. We call ourselves a park for all people. We've had people coming to this park for over a century. And much like you, you have a state park. Part of our national park started as a state park. It started as uh, the Kendall Legend State Park. And it was actually owned by the state, but managed by a local metropolitan park district. And they brought in the CCC because they were trying to create recreational amenities for the population. We are a valley. All the water that falls on the east and the west wants to get down to the river. So we are a refuge for people and animals. We have several waterfalls in the park. Actually, we have dozens of waterfalls, but a few of them are on trails. And this is kind of our icon, if you will. It falls a mere 60 feet down into Brandywine Creek below and eventually joining the Cuyahoga River. We do consider ourselves a refuge for natural diversity because we are a green spot between two major metropolitan areas. We do have some areas within the park that have unique habitats and climates. We have one area called the ledges where they have sandstone cliffs and hemlock trees. And if you go there, you think you may be magically transported to someplace further north in Canada, but you're not. Although you may see animals or birds migrating through that would not normally be here, but they stop over to take a quick rest. If you were looking for that refuge of, of natural diversity, you might want to stop at the beaver marsh, which is in the southern part of the park. And this beaver marsh is a refuge for all kinds of animals. You may see snapping turtles, painted turtles, or the namesake, the beaver, cranes. If you're really lucky, maybe you'll see a bald eagle. Now, if you look in that lower left-hand corner, you'll see this wooden structure. That's a boardwalk. The boardwalk actually follows in this area, the historic route of the old towpath trail, but now it's a wetland, and it may have been a wetland in the prehistoric times, but it's a wetland, I guess, again, and that boardwalk follows out over. So you can walk right out over the marsh and maybe have your first sighting ever of a great blue heron or a timber doodle or a woodcock or some other bird out there. We like the beaver marsh in particular because the beaver marsh is just one of the stories of how we're an, an environmental icon. Because the beaver marsh didn't start as a beaver marsh. It, started as an auto salvage yard. Um, and then we purchased it 
uh, from the owner. Now we have, yay, the park service has an auto, auto salvage yard. So the park service banded together with the Sierra Club and we cleaned it all up because we thought it would be a really good idea to put a big parking lot there for other services. And in the meantime, when we went back to work on that parking lot, the beaver had moved in. So for that round, the beaver won and now we have a beaver marsh. Because you see that the environment is relatively forgiving. In 1969, we had the last of what may have been 13 individual fires that started in the time of the Civil War, actually. But all these fires, 15 years after we became a national recreation area, we did a study in the Cuyahoga River and we found four fish species. One of them was a goldfish. The EPA was so concerned about us that they made us what they call an area of concern. This is like EPA's rivers naughty list. But since that river burned, we've had EPA established, we've had Clean Water Act, we've had air pollution laws, we've had soil pollution laws, the Park Service has worked to clean things up. Volunteers have come together to clean things up. People have come to care about the river. And now that river flows with some 70 different species of fish, bald eagles, otters. It's even a state water trail now. And we're slowly, slowly chipping away, much like those Irish immigrants when they were carving out those stones, chipping away at things that are on the area of concern and removing them one by one so we hope to get off the naughty list. But we're not really here to talk about the big picture of Cuyahoga Valley. We're here to take a look at the Ohio and Erie Canal. And listening to Mark talk earlier, I was acutely aware of some of the similarities and some of the differences. If I understood right, many of your walls are lined with those rocks. Ours are berms. We didn't have access to good granite, so we had to use sandstone. And yes, we were started in the same year, 1825. It took us about two years to complete the first section, which was between Cleveland and Akron. But when we completed that, we had 38 miles of canal, 44 locks, but it would take five more years before they finished the rest of the canal. And just like your canal there at the Blackstone, we started off with Irish workers, immigrants. Sometimes we had a few German, groups working on the canal, but mostly Irish. In this valley, we say that for every mile of canal, there's got to be at least one Irishman buried. In the early days, in that upper left-hand picture, you'll see a passenger packet. Those were, were the most dominant form that was in the earliest days of the canal, moving people back and forth. The larger picture on your right is actually a freight boat. And that's what became more common. Initially, we did use horses, much like the Blackstone, because they moved faster. You can keep them moving for a while, but they eat a lot of grain. So in time, as passengers became fewer and freight became more important, we switched over to three mules. So that's the quick introduction to the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And it's an introduction to the Ohio and Erie Canal. There are many similarities and I think we're going to explore those at this point. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Sounds good, thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, I, and even beyond that, I just wanna say before we talk a little bit more about the canals themselves, I hope that those of you who are locals to the Blackstone Valley, um, see why we chose Cuyahoga as our partner tonight, right? There is so, even beyond just the canals, there are so many connections from a river, river that was polluted 
um, which led people to decide to start cleaning it to the connections of the parks being part of a larger heritage corridor that is around mm -hmm. um, them that kind of links major metropolitan areas to tow paths that have become bike paths to uh, marshes that were once parking lots and EPA uh, major issue zones and now are these lovely um, places, whether it's the Beaver Marsh in Cuyahoga or Lonsdale Marsh in mm -hmm. uh, Lincoln, Rhode Island here. Um, all of these connections. And so it's just really awesome. Just hearing uh, you talk about Cuyahoga, Rebecca, is pretty awesome to see all these connections. Um, somebody asked the question in the chat about a uh, leather. And I think that that kind of gets at the heart of what I was mentioning earlier. They said, why leather? Um, and I think that, you know, one of our really interesting parallels between both canals, both the Ohio and Erie and the Blackstone, is the idea that there was other industry located around these canals. And that maybe we could just talk a little bit about some of those industries that were there and why um, they were there and how uh, they, the canal was used to help further those industries. Well, on the Cuyahoga, anywhere you had a lock, you had falling water. And if you got falling water, you got, as you know, you got power. So for the larger part, throughout much of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, I'm going to talk about the National Park for the moment. For the larger story, most at locks, you would have other businesses like taverns, stores, groceries, repair shops, but by and large, that was the most common. A few, you would have larger mills, grist mills to grind grain. You may have uh, paper mills in later years. Uh, we had a number, we had a grist mill and a sawmill in Boston and similar things in Peninsula where they were using the water power. But the story's a little bit different south of us because um, Wow, I'm having a height envy because we only fell 195 feet from our summit at Akron down to Lake Erie. But for those first 20 miles, it's only a gain of like a foot of a foot a mile. It's just it's a really low gain of altitude. But once you got close to Akron, you had 15 locks in a row. You literally came out of one lock and the boat went right into the next one. Came out of that one, went right into the next one. Came out, it's just, and one boat could go down and then one boat had to go up. So that was a stopgap. That was at Akron, Akron High Point. And there are all kinds of industry. They had woolen mills, they had saw mills, they had grist mills. Ma a matter of fact, the ancestor of a grist mill or a grist grain company you may have heard of, um, we had one little grist mill that produced something that became called um, Quaker Oats. So these are the kinds of things, although one of the things the canal was bringing in ironically was the woven cotton fabric from your Eastern mills. So we were shipping out our corn and, and salt pork and wheat and some of that corn and wheat may or may not have been liquid. <laughs> but we're shipping those things out, and in return, we're getting your your goods, and we're getting goods imported like China, um, furniture, oh, Lady Godie's fashioning fashion book, you know, things mm -hmm. like. That. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting point because we see, too, right, New England in each one of these mill villages in the Blackstone Valley, there was certainly a company farm that was part of the makeup of that landscape because you had to still feed people. But New England's not the best farmland. And so on the flip side, right, where we may be exporting these finished textiles, these finished products out, we see also the importation mm -hmm. of foodstuffs um, from the West and, of course, cotton from the American South. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of this, uh, if you will, the American system or this trade, this domestic trade within mm -hmm. the na nation that we see all of uh, these facets connecting. Um, you mentioned like a domino. Exactly. One is led to the next. Exactly. 
Um, you mentioned the almost elevator like system of locks. Um, and somebody earlier in the chat uh, asked a, a really cool, interesting question about how would you handle, obviously there are canal boats going up and coming down, right? They're moving in both directions. Well, when you have these canal barges that are attached to a horse team, how would you uh, allow them to pass? Um, and I, I don't know about how your canal worked, but here, um, and you mentioned, I think, I think at some point you mentioned your dimensions and ours was 40 feet wide at the top and 26 feet wide at the bottom. So you could have passing canal traffic, but only between locks. And in ours, we had laws because it sounds like yours was more privately run and ours was, or like a private company and ours was kind of this free for all, everybody had their own boats or you might have a company that had a series of packet boats, but because the canal was owned by the state and yes, the state pays for it by taxing you, but everybody's running boats. Um, I kind of lost my, my thread there for a second. So everybody's running boats, but when they want to pass, by law, by state law, the boat going, and I have to think about this for a second, the boat pulling upstream has the right of way. The downstream boat, and they gotta they gotta let the other boat go. Mm -hmm. So they would the boat going downstream would often let their ropes go limp, if you will. And if the boat going upstream was nice, they'd grab the rope and walk it back over the top of their boat. But if they were not so nice or were in a hurry, you'd have to have your rope dragging underneath, which means it could get caught, it could get snagged. Mm -hmm. Now your rope's wet. Who wants to handle a heavy, wet rope? So that's how they would pass. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's the exact same process in the Blackstone, uh, as you alluded to, a little bit different with the fact that, you know, there's the canal company in the Blackstone Canal who's really setting a lot of these rules and regulations, and they're kind of operating the canal more on a railroad-based system where they own the canal barges, mm -hmm. they're kind of dictating all that stuff, um, but it's the same deal. If you were going up canal, if you were going upstream fighting the current, you were allowed the right of way, and so it's the same basic process. If you're coming down canal, and I think uh, John Marsland made a, a, a mention of this earlier in the chat that, you know, going a uh, down canal must have been a lot easier than going up because especially with the Blackstone, and I think that this is kind of starting to uh, get into some of the differences between the two canals, um, but the Blackstone actually wove in and out of the river itself. Yeah. And so not digging a, a hand dug canal for the entire 45 mile length, but actually taking advantage of the stagnant water that you would have behind a mill dam in the mill pond and utilizing that as part of uh, the canal. So literally having the towpath around the side of a mill pond. And then once you got to a dam, obviously the barge is not going to go right over the dam, having to dig out uh, the actual dug canal and then going through a series of rock locks to adjust for that drop of the dam and then wow. eventually making its way downstream again and weaving back into the river. Was that uh, what happened with the Ohio and Erie? is completely independent of the river. Independent of, but dependent on. So it is a separate water course. And after the first few years, they were actually, they would manage even the tributary streams, whether they were coming in or going out. But it was a completely separate from the Cuyahoga River. Of course, once it gets to Akron, then it goes to, there's, ours is more than one river. It actually is the, Cuyahoga, uh, Tuscarawas, Muskingum, Scioto. So there's a number of rivers, but each time it borrows the water from them, but it is independent. It doesn't go into the river at any, any point until later years. At some point in the mid 19th century, they were like, oh, let's just chop off the last few miles of the canal and let it go straight into the Cuyahoga River because then we can transfer stuff onto the boats easier. Hmm. Fascinating. 
Um, I think, though, one of the most striking differences um, between our two canals is their length of operation. And so the mm-hmm. Blackstone, as I already alluded to, only lasts for 20 years before the Providence and Worcester Railroad uh, surpasses it, pretty much runs the same length as the Blackstone Canal. And I think that that's a huge and important point to make um, is that when we talk about the canal and who funds the canal, many of the individuals who are investing in this canal are industrialists in the valley. And Mm -hmm. so although they'll never make their money back on income from their investment in the canal, right, they're investing in kind of this public service of sorts that makes transportation much cheaper and easier for Mm -hmm. them and that benefits them. And then once the railroad starts to take hold by the 1830s, 1840s, they build the Providence and Worcester rail line in 1847. Now it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to transport even more goods on the railroads. That causes the demise of the canal at that point. Uh, but I understand that the Ohio and Erie had a much longer uh, shelf life, if you will, than the Blackstone <laughs> did. So uh, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about why that was. So our ent- entire canal, it took seven years to complete from start to finish. So it was finished in 1832. In 1832, 1832 to like 1850, 55, that's the heyday. That's, and then we get the arrival of the trains along the edges, but still the canal keeps going. And in the civil war, we see the highest number of tolls collected, boats going on the canal, tonnage of freight, because the trains are busy elsewhere with military operations. So it continues to hang on, but after the civil war, they turn it over to private company to manage and it, Then at some point, the state takes it back over and they keep managing it because we need the canals for national defense, you know, Mm -hmm. that was their reasoning. Then in 1913, there was a flood and that flood uh, almost wiped the entire cities of Peninsula and Boston off the map. Um, And after that, it was so bad that they, the state decided to put its money back in the railroads instead of in the canal. You made an interesting mention though of the funding for yours. And ours was funded, the state sold bonds. You could invest in it. And oddly enough, a great number of people who invested in it were from New York. Because keep in mind, you know, 1825, at that point, when we start our canal, they've been digging on that Erie Canal for years, and it doesn't get finished until the year that we're actually starting. Right. So they can see that that if we can get goods to them and across their canal, they're going to be able to tax our goods and charge tolls on our goods. So this is going to benefit them to have an extension. So a lot of people in New York And a lot of local investors and private investors bought the state bonds. The Ohio and Erie Canal, in terms of the bigger history of picture of canals, was probably one of the last canals to actually be able to pay back all of its investors. After that, labor became so expensive because the Irish realized they had a good skill. So labor became so expensive that Canals that were started or finished after that never made the profit that mm-hmm. we, and the profit was just not just the goods, but like property values went up 160% along the canal. Wow. wow. That's pretty impressive. And the Blackstone's the exact opposite. Uh, the investors never come close to making their money back. Uh, on the books at least, right? We can argue and debate about whether or not if those were local investors who were investing in the infrastructure to help make their business more affordable, right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not they benefited in the long run. Um, But the... At heart there, um was that uh, the uh, budget they end up going over budget 
And so they've given money back that they actually end up needing. It ends up costing them close to $700,000. So right from the beginning, the company is starting in the hole and they're never able to overcome that with only 20 years of operation. They never even come close to making their money back. Um, but I think that there, there's this great story of these industrialists meeting in Worcester um, and they're kind of having a party for the Providence and Worcester Railroad. And their toast is uh, to uh, the two means that connected Worcester. One as weak as water, they said, and one as strong as iron and kind of an allusion to the differences between the canal and the railroad. And to me, that really kind of indicates, um, you know, how many of these people were the same people who invested in both. And it's really their end game to link these two mm -hmm. locations for their uh, economic benefit. Um, just fascinating stuff. Um, we are getting near the end of our time together here. So I was just wondering, uh, for those of us who have never visited Cuyahoga before, uh, what is the best way to visit the park? Uh, what kind of resources would you suggest? Uh, how, how would we experience your park? I'm going to suggest to everyone that they start their trip by visiting the visitor center. Boston, uh, Boston Mill Visitor Center, which is located at the intersection of Riverview and Boston Mill Road. But if you want to do some pre-post planning, maybe you check us out on at www.nps.gov slash CUVA. We are also, I'm seeing the social media stuff flying back and forth. We're also on social media. We also are working on the National Park Service app. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, so we're out there. So we would love to see you at the park. And I think I will see a few of your colleagues next week here in our park. You will. We have a few uh, folks who are going out there to visit because as we've seen here, right, there's a lot of really brilliant and really cool connections between our two sites. And so I know that those who are going out to visit all of you are very excited um, about that. And I am extremely grateful for you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening um, oh, for this you. talk. Um, I will also put in a little plug uh, for a really cool project that we worked on. If you're interested in learning more about the state park um, and the site there, and especially the canal, um, a few years ago, we did a virtual tour of the site, which is available on our website. And I know that Allison has been hard at work here, uh, putting stuff in the chat. And I appreciate that. A lot of really cool uh, resources, including a park stamp for participating here tonight. So check that out in the chat. Uh, you can put that in your uh, stamp book, if you will. Um, but it's a really cool virtual tour that does a great job of kind of giving the overview and uh, the history of the site and talks a lot about the Blackstone Canal. So I encourage all of you uh, to check that out. Just kind of in conclusion, I just wanna say that, you know, these human constructed landscapes, because that's what these canals were really, changed the natural environments in which they were situated, mm -hmm. turning unnavigable rivers into highways of water. Parts of both still remain, a testament to the skilled craftsmen who constructed them. Although canals may not be at the forefront of our minds, we still build in and alter our environment. Learning lessons from our past and looking to our future, we will have to confront how future innovations and technologies that we construct will change the world for better and potentially for worse. What will the legacy of the things that we construct be in our own time? And so with that, I want to thank you all for joining us here this evening. Uh, we will hang out a little while after if you are interested uh, in unmuting yourself and kind of having a more informal conversation. Uh, we'll hang out for a little while. But if not, we hope to see you next week where we will be joined by uh, Wright Brothers National Memorial down in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, uh, to discuss the connections between another one of our park sites, Whitensville, and the story of the Wright Brothers. So we hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody. Rebecca, you know, as I anticipated, there was just so much to talk about that we didn't even get the half of the things that we possibly could have. Yeah, we, we, we had like a list that was forever long. <laughs> there was, yeah, horses versus mules, what, the difference in what we're shipping. Um, and I was trying to catch up with the chat. Um, I know I've missed questions, but... 
Yeah, there were a few other questions there. I tried to loop some of them in. But again, if you're still here and you want to chat a little bit, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask oh, one new message. I'll see about that. Someone did ask a, a question about the towpath trail here in Cuyahoga Valley National Park. You do have to go on roads at some point, but, and there is a little bit of an incline there, but they try to keep you off of major roads. And recently one of my coworkers had an assignment and his job for the afternoon was to ride his bicycle from the visitor center to Edgewater Park on Lake Erie. So it is, it is doable and, um, we have a similar thing with the Blackstone uh, bikeway that there are portions of it. Technically, you can go from Slater Mill, where we're located up through the state park and all the way up almost to the state line at this point up in Woonsocket. Uh, but there are definitely portions of that that are on road. But there is a decent chunk and Bonnie will correct me if I'm wrong here. But it's a good almost 16 miles of paved bike path that are contiguous mm. um, that you can ride. Um, and so in a similar way though, right. How do you interact with the landscape? How do you move with what already exists? Um, we do have maps for hours and you can pick those up at the visitor center or look online. There is a question from the chat about the locks being narrow and what is the width of your locks? About 10 feet on average. And ours are, will be between 14 and 15 feet. So our canal boats could be up to 14 feet wide. And you would just have one boat in the in the lock and then it would go out. And if there's another boat waiting to go in the opposite direction, great. If not, and there's a boat waiting behind the one that just went through, they have to go through the whole cycle to get the next boat. Mm -hmm. So it you could get lost at a lock for a while. Mm -hmm. The same basic and process too with the Blackstone uh, where you're one at a time. Um, and on average, the canal boats were about nine and a half feet wide. So about 70 feet long, about nine and a half feet wide. So just wide enough that you could fit into the lock. Mm -hmm. And so the horse team pulling you into the lock, the gates closing, either water being let in or let out, and then opening the other gate and allowing you to continue on. Uh, but that definitely is a great question. And there was, um, when you're saying that, you know, I would encourage people to remember that, that we were the wild, wild west at that time. So in some of our villages, um, one of the villages you would come in and as you come into the village, there's a saloon, you come through the, the aqueduct, there's a bar, you go through the lock. Oh, in the middle of the lock on the side, there's a grocery store to get you more alcohol. And then before you cross the road, there's another bar. And then before you hit the boat, the boat yard, there's a, uh, yeah. Sounds like a great time. Yeah. yeah. How people ever manage to get out of one of the little villages here and still have the mules walk straight? I don't know. So, um, hi, this is Patty. Hi, Patty. Hi. hi, hi, Mark. I jumped in late because I was um, celebrating with Irish um, mushroom stew from Ooh. the local from the local harvest kitchen with a friend Ooh. across the way. <laughs> So, but I just, you know, I grew up in Lowell, Mass, and there's some similarities there with the Pawtucket Canal in mm -hmm. particular, which was the transportation canal. So I can actually say that I've actually operated a lock and I've actually been in a boat that's gone through a lock. That's kind of cool. Now, mm -hmm. down in Cuyahoga, do you have canal boats? Um, I, I thought I've seen pictures of like canal boats down there because I work with the tourism office. We have one canal boat that we use as a um, overnight stay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if you guys did something similar. So yes and no, not the answer you wanted, but within the national park, no, we do not have canal boats because our first superintendent had a gentleman's agreement with two other locations with what is within the national heritage corridor now, not to have them so we have one in um, Canal Fulton, which is just a little bit to the south, that's uh, operated by the city of Canal Fulton. And then there's another one in Coshocton, which is even further south. So we don't have them, but we do have a functioning lock. And I have seen uh, canoes going up and down the canal before and kayaks. So hopefully when we get the water back in the watered section, because we have had some issues with some siltation. Mm. Yeah. 
So when we get the water yeah. back and hopefully this year or next, then we will be seeing water craft traveling up and down again. Yeah, that, the canal boat is run by the Tourism Council where I work, mm -hmm. Blackstone mm -hmm. Valley, and it basically sits on the river, not even in the canal. And we've done things like it's an authentic British canal boat that was built in England. And we've Ooh. done things like British tea tours and and then we've had overnight stays where we've delivered breakfast to the guests in the morning and brought them lobsters for dinner at night if they wanted it. And, <laughs> and we're hopefully going to be putting it back. So if you're ever visiting Blackstone area, please check, you know, have Mark get in touch with me and we'll get you out on the canal boat. <laughs> All right. I hope your canal boat is more comfortable than the packets that we used to have traveling up and down the Ohio at Erie because some of our packet ships were not I the most comfortable. We've they had some for we've dinner, had, that's for sure. Yeah, we've had some good reviews, but you don't want to be too too tall for the bed. Um because <laughs> it it doesn't I don't think a anyone over six feet would be comfortable in the bed that's there. But yeah, it's it's an interesting way of life. I I spent um a night on there before a dragon boat race and uh, spent most of the night watching the egret that was out in the marsh. <laughs> Thanks for that question, Patty. Um, Bernard has an interesting question. Um, are there any initiatives or interest in restoring or rewatering portions of the canals at either site where the remaining sections are still in recoverable position? Um, Rebecca, I'll let you take a shot at that one first. <laughs> Yes, um, we have a section that is actually the Ohio and Erie Canal National Heritage Corridor, and that has been traditionally the watered section. Um, we've had some issues with uh, one, a leaky canal, and two, um, siltation. So for the last few years, we haven't had water. We've actually now worked out an agreement to get the water back in. We're hoping the pump turns on next month. Um, so we will have water again. Um, we're actually in the process and I, I, I can, we have a large tome. We're writing a cultural landscape report that is actually Bernard focusing on that rehabilitating parts of the canal and rehabilitating parts of the prism. Cause there's some parts of the prism where that ditch is so compromised, it will not consistently hold water anymore but at least giving people the chance to see where it was and for them to understand, oh, this was part of it. We can see water in a section further north. Mm -hmm. um, in the valley, in the Blackstone Valley, um, we have two really well-preserved sections of the canal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the story of why they are well-preserved is fascinating in and of itself. Uh, Allison will, um, perhaps roll her eyes because I talk about this a lot. Um, but the two sections that are well-preserved is the one that we talked about tonight in the State Park and the one that I briefly mentioned up at Riverbend Farm in Uxbridge. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, when the canal closed, um, there were mills that had mm -hmm. a vested interest in keeping those canals open not for transportation purposes, but for powering their mills. So mm -hmm. we see them transfer at both sites from being a transportation canal to actually a water power canal, if you will, a massive, very long raceway. Um, and so at the Blackstone River State Park, the canal, that segment of the canal, which is about three miles long, running all the way down into Lonsdale, was kept open as a power canal for the mills three miles south down in Lonsdale. And at first, the Kelly Mill, which was on that site too, was still mm -hmm. using the canal at that point um, as a water power, as, as their source of water power. And so there was a vested interest in protecting the canal um, at that point. Most other sections of the Blackstone Canal where they were, um, that was diverting water out of the river, right? We talked about the nature of how the canal was built and how it's weaving in and out of the river. When that water is diverting, being diverted away from the river, right? What is that doing? Well, it's taking water potentially away from an industrialist who wants to use that water in their mill. 
So you block off that segment of the canal and there's portions of the canal that have either like in Woonsocket and in Worcester that have just been completely built over and are now underneath wow. city streets or in other places are nothing more than what looks like a little trench in the woods. Um, We've whether got or not those- also got Akron is the same way right yep. over the canal. Yep, and in Woonsocket and Worcester are two great examples of where you can literally walk on a street that was once uh, the Blackstone Canal. Um, I, as for restoration, rehab work, uh, of course, within the Blackstone River State Park, especially, um, we're interested. Um, we too there have been having issues with siltation and other things, a lot of trees and other debris that have fallen in the canal that threaten those beautiful stone walls that I was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Those stone walls have withstood the test of time because there's really no mortar there, right? When there's, if those walls were mortared, the pressure of the water and the soil would push on those walls mm -hmm. and eventually cause them to break because uh, they're basically dry stacked that would that allows for the free movement of water and soil through the stone. Um, so certainly in those places like the Blackstone River State Park, we do have an interest. We want to be able to tell folks that they can paddle again down that portion of the canal. Right now, there's just too much debris in the canal uh, to allow mm -hmm. for that. Um, so in certain areas, we want to make sure that those well-preserved, those areas of the canal that were handed down to us, we want to make sure that they're being protected and preserved. As for uh, what is a ditch in the middle of the woods, maybe one day, uh, but no time in the near future. Maybe someday we'll be kayaking down it. Maybe. Um, not that long. I mean, there was a major windstorm that blew down a lot of debris just a few years ago. And up until that point, it was easily passable, the section of the canal through the state park. Um, so it'd be mm -hmm. nice to, to get that back open again. Absolutely. And, and the reason we have a watered section is also because of mills. But ours was because the steel mills wanted to use the water. <laughs> It's cooler to, it, it's cheaper to use canal water to cool your steel mill than it is to buy water from the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I always use the analogy, I'm gonna go off here a, a little bit. Uh, I always use the analogy of when I bought my first house, there was a green toilet, a green tub and a green sink in the bathroom. Allison's laughing because she knows where this is going. Um, what was the first thing to go when I remodeled that bathroom? the green tub, the green sink, and the green toilet. Why? Because I didn't want that kind of design in my modern bathroom, right? My wife didn't want it in our bathroom, right? We got rid of it. We tossed it out. Well, somebody who purchases that house maybe in a hundred years from now may look back and be like, why would they ever do that? That was the original fixtures for the house. That was the original mm -hmm. toilet for this house, right? That's a historic mm -hmm. artifact, right? Why would you ever get rid of that? Well, it wasn't a value to us. We didn't see the value in it. Um, and so similarly, uh, luckily uh, in the portions that we have preserved of the canal, people saw the value in it. And that's why this historic mm -hmm. resource is still there. Uh, in other places, it was just like my green toilet, right? It got tossed out. They didn't see the value in it. And now we don't have that historic resource, resource left there anymore. Um, so it's an interesting story and kind of case study in historic mm -hmm. preservation and what leads to um, preserving uh, things. Um, Eric said there is a state Ooh. grant that the Blackstone River Watershed Council will be using to clear the canal of downed trees. Nice. Hopefully this spring, the silt removal will take a little longer, but we're making progress. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Eric, for those of you who do not know, is our superintendent. So I thank Eric for that update. Um, and certainly thank the Blackstone River Watershed Council. Uh, John Marslin uh, was here at one point um, uh, and all the members of the Watershed Council for all their work and their help and all that they do to make sure that not only the canal, but the river um, stay in a clean state. Um, they do a lot of tree removal. They do a lot of cleanups and stuff like that, as does uh, a lot of groups in the valley, certainly. Um, so thank you to everybody who works to keep the river clean for sure. Well, if nobody else has any other questions, uh, thank you again, everybody, and we hope to see you all next week.